Towels in here. Oh, Finally! Hey there folks, Mike for CMCC Builds here with Optimizing Critical Role. And here we are in the final stretch. We've done all the cast members except for Talos and Jaffe. Liam got two videos for his build for Caleb and Frumpkin. Marisha got two videos for Monks and Bo. And Talison, the hardest name in the entire cast to spell, gets a whopping three videos. The first, today's, will optimize Caduceus Clay, not to be confused with the great Cassius Clay. And the final two will dive into Bloodhunters and Molly Mock. And that'll be a wrap on the Campaign 2 analysis. Let me know in the comments below if you want to see Campaign 1 or Campaign 3 next. And no, I don't think I have it in me to do an optimizing Matt Mercer video, but if I did decide to do one, I know exactly how I'd do it. If this is your first time watching Optimizing Critical Role, the goal here is to show how I would optimize these character concepts by making them as effective as possible for the table, Matt's campaign, and that character concept without losing the essence of the character. That means we may or may not change the subclass, as we did with Caleb. That means we may have to change a weapon or featured spell like we did with Yasha. And since Tasha's released mid-campaign too, I will use it, like I have for every single build. The goal is not to show how the Critical Role cast messed up, or how they're wrong and I'm right, especially since I'm using post-Tasha's rules, the framework I'm using to build these characters could vary wildly from what was available to the cast. Now let's talk about Caduceus. He's very likely my favorite of the four Jaffe characters. A strong argument can be made for Percy as Taliesin's best character, but the laid-back, wise, proverb-spitting, jovial, non-judgmental badass is kind of my favorite character archetype, if you can call it that. I don't know if Taliesin comes up with his quotes beforehand, I assume he does, but wow do I love them throughout this campaign. It's important not to get angry at people for what they don't know. But was he optimized? Well, yeah, pretty much. I don't love Furbolgs, but pre-Tasha's that plus two to wisdom is spot on, the abilities are mostly in the right spot, and Warcaster is an optimal pickup for this build. So that's it, that's the video. Thanks for stopping by. Nah, I'm kidding. Of course. With Tasha's, a whole world was open to the optimizer, and now we can move those stats around, which frees up opportunities to use different feats and half feats to boost ability scores and provide some useful features. With that, let's dive into optimizing critical role. For Caduceus's race, as always, I'm sticking with the chosen race, Furball. The Gith Sarai is probably the best racial choice for clerics behind variant humans and custom lineage. Harangon is also a strong pick for any spellcaster. I'm currently playing a Hexwiz Harangon, and that initiative bump and the rabbit hop feature is as strong as any spellcasting feat. And to be fair, watching Taliesin play a giant wisdom spouting bunny would have been amazing. Watch out, Doc. But since Tal picked Furbolg, let's stick with that and see what we can do. For Furbolg magic, we will of course choose Wisdom for the spellcasting modifier. This feature provides a couple of spells, both situationally useful. Hidden Step, Powerful Build, and Speech of Beast and Leaf are mediocre abilities at best. It, it is what it is. Moving on. For abilities, Taliesin rolled three 16s, a 12, and two 9s. With these rolls and the makeup of the party, I almost certainly would have played a Paladin or a Ranger, or even a Mercy Monk if it was available. All three have strong healing abilities and can make good use of three high stats, but given the character concept, we'll stick with Cleric. So where do we want those stats? Because we can move racial ASI, we'll want to shift around the original stats. Strength 9, Dexterity 16, Constitution 16, Intelligence 9, Wisdom 16, and Charisma 10. The racial ASI will bump Constitution to 17 and Wisdom to 18. I switch Charisma and Dexterity because Dexterity is the more important stat, and dropping from a 16 to 12 Charisma should have no major implications on roleplaying for your character. Dexterity needs to be a minimum of 14 to take full advantage of medium armor, and the original 12 all but forced Taliesin to use an ASI on a tertiary stat, which is completely suboptimal. That 16 allows for the plus 2 to be used with Caduceus' Green Beetle Breastplate, while also boosting initiative to plus 3. This also opens up the possibility of taking the medium armor master feat down the road to bump AC by plus one and allow Caduceus to wear half plate without the disadvantage to stealth checks, further increasing his AC to a total of plus two for this one feat. For background, Taliesin took the Far Traveler background to get proficiency in insight and perception, both excellent skills that fit extremely well on a wisdom based character like Cad. Along with these skills, this background gives one language and one instrument or gaming set proficiency. 
you wanted to change out the gaming set for something more useful like Thieves Tools or an Herbalist kit, that would be a perfectly reasonable substitution, especially the latter for a character like Caduceus. Before we jump into starting class, let's discuss Tal's goal with this character. He spoke about wanting to explore life and death, and specifically how it pertains to the natural order of things. Because of that, he went with the Grave Cleric as a subclass choice. This is one of the weaker Cleric subclasses in the game. The Nature Cleric jumps out as an obvious selection. Unfortunately, this subclass may be the only subclass that's worse than the Grave Cleric. Maybe Knowledge, I don't know. But Nature Cleric fits extremely well with a follower of the Wild Mother and all of the themes of death that Tal wanted to explore can still be explored here. And then finally, the most powerful option would be something like Death Cleric. Now the Death Cleric is extremely underrated by almost everyone I see online, including some of those big YouTubers that do class and subclass rankings. The channel divinity alone can output significant damage numbers, and with the average or DMG recommended number of short rest, those damage numbers can outshine even the Paladin's Divine Smite damage contribution. Death Clerics are no joke, but unfortunately, Rather than exploring the natural themes and cycles of life and death, this cleric is more aligned with necromancy, someone who dabbles in dark magic and the undead. What sort of dark magic is this? Which takes us way off the path of Taliesin's character design. For that reason, we'll stick with his pick, the Grave Cleric, but not a level one. For the starting class, we're gonna take Druid. If you watch my Arcana Cleric build here, this may sound familiar to you. The combination of Thorn Whip and Spirit Guardians is too enticing to pass up on a build like this. Druid also provides several defensive and support spells not available to clerics, while also shoring up the nature slash cleric aspect of Caduceus' background, without having to actually go with the nature cleric. There are a couple of downsides to multiclassing this build. First, we lose out on the level 16 ASI feat. That's okay, we're gonna build around that. Which means, unfortunately, some of the excellent half feats we wanted will be unavailable to us. Second, druids can't, or more accurately won't, whatever that means, wear metal armor, which is perfect because Cad wears beetle armor. Another great fit for druid. And finally, this multiclass does slow our spell progression a bit. A one level dip when a spellcaster can have major power ramifications. Yes, because both druid and cleric are full casters, the spell slot progression will remain unaffected, but Caduceus will be a level behind Jester, Caleb, and even Ford for much of the game in terms of actual available spell level. In other words, at level 5 when Caduceus enters the game, he will be casting 2nd level spells instead of 3rd level spells like Caleb. Although it's important to say that clerics may be the full casting class least affected by this delayed spell casting because they have 2 of the 3 most powerful spells to upcast with Spirit Guardians and Aid. So those are the negatives. What does Caduceus get with Druid? For the skill proficiencies, Tal took Religion, which makes sense for a cleric, and Medicine. I personally would take nature instead of medicine because Cad lived his whole life in the Blooming Grove, worshipping the Wild Mother, but as a caretaker of the dead, medicine works perfectly fine here as well. He learns Druidic, which is whatever, we're here for the spells. I'll cover the cleric spells en masse at the end of the video. For druid cantrips, of course, Thorn Whip. Get over here! To pull enemies back into Spirit Guardians and into other AoE traps set by Caleb, Ford, and others. Shalele is a common pickup for staff-wielding druids and rangers, but for Caduceus, I like Mold Earth. The damage from Shalele is a small piece of his total DPR, which will largely come from spells like Spirit Guardians and Spiritual Weapon. Reshaping the ground around him with the divine support of the Wild Mother is an image that fits well for me. Mold Earth also happens to be a quality cantrip with a lot of utility in and out of combat. Shape Water is another one of these types of cantrips, but thematically I favor Earth to Water for Cad. For the first level druid spells, Caduceus will eventually be able to prepare 6. Absorb Elements is a strong first level defensive spell, and unavailable to clerics. This will help a lot in those battles against Geladon or other dangerous creatures with elemental attacks. Animal Friendship or Beast Sense works for that nature connection. Entangle is a solid first level control spell that can lock down enemies in a 20 foot square. This probably stretches the bounds of Cad's connection in nature, but it should certainly fit. Fog Cloud is another excellent first level spell that produces heavy obscurement, effectively blinding anyone inside without blind or true sight. This has so many uses, especially against enemy casters. Protection from evil and good helps in those battles against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. And finally, the big one, Goodberry. Likely the best healing spell in the game and one of the better spells to upcast, this provides 10 points of healing per spell level. In addition to the power level, I like the idea of someone flavoring the good berry to be part of Caduceus's tea. Like instead of berries, there are actually tea leaves that he uses to make tea that fills anyone up who drinks it, heals them a bit, etc. And in combat, he can shove those tea leaves in a fallen ally's mouth and bring them back to one hit point. It would have been really cool if the dead person tea he drank had some mechanical use beyond just its narrative function. And at this point, switch to Cleric for the next four levels that brings Cad right to level 5 where he met the rest of the Mighty Nine. 
Level 1 gives Circle of Mortality, which allows for max healing on downed allies, and the Spare the Dying cantrip as a bonus action spell with 30 foot range. Eyes of the Dead for a Detect Undead Wisdom mod times per day. At level 2, clerics get their Channel to Divinity, and Grave Clerics get Path to the Grave, which gives a single target vulnerability to the next attack against them. This is great if the next attack is a Paladin max smiting on a critical, and not so good if it's a Monk landing a 1d4 bonus action on Arb Strike. The point here is that this ability can be very powerful or very weak, and that uncertainty makes it a much weaker ability than something like the Death Cleric's Channel Divinity, which simply adds necrotic damage to the Cleric's attack. Because of the swinginess and power level, Harness Divine Power, a Tasha's addition to Clerics, which allows for a Channel Divinity to be used to replace spell levels, becomes significantly more appealing to Clerics, like this, with situationally useful or even bad Channel Divinities. If Tal had the option in Campaign, he should have used this ability often. At Cleric level 4, Cad gets his ASI feet and will do what Talison did and take Warcaster to make sure that Caduceus can hold a staff, in this case a Magic Blight Staff, along with a shield. And of course, Warcaster gives the much needed advantage to concentration checks to maintain concentration on a spell, and clerics have a ton of great spells to concentrate on, starting right at level 1 with Bless. And finally, Warcaster allows the spellcaster to cast a spell instead of a weapon attack when getting an opportunity attack. All three clauses of the feat are useful on this build. Character levels 6 through 9 stick with cleric to level 8. Destroy Undead at Cleric 5 improves the Channel Divinity option while also getting 3rd level spells here. Broken record, I know, but Spirit Guardians. Oh, spirits! At Cleric 6, Sentinel at Death's Door gives the very fun feature of negating enemy crits on allies within 30 feet. Such a cool defensive ability to have. And it would be completely useless with 1 D&D rules, so make sure you take that survey, folks. At Cleric level 8, another ASI. And here, max out Wisdom. If we had the ASI feats to play around with, I'd like to take two half feats instead of one ASI, because it adds a ton of fun and power to these builds. Fey Touched of course works with his connection to Jester and the Traveler, Shadow Touch could even work with some narrative creativity, given that he was living inside a cursed forest, I don't think that's too much of a stretch. But alas, it's not to be. We don't have the room for it, but if the campaign were to go beyond 16, this would be the move. Here we'll go with the ASI to max wisdom. At this level, Grave Clerics also get potent spellcasting, which allows for your Wisdom mod to be added to any Cleric cantrip. That's a plus 5 right now. We could switch this out for Blessed Strikes, which gives flexibility of adding a D8 to either a cantrip or weapon attack, but that's a touch weaker for a character focus on spellcasting. And from here to level 16, we'll stick with Cleric, getting a final ASI feat at Cleric 12. At this point, we'll want to absolutely shore up those concentration saves by taking Resilient Con. This bumps Constitution to a fantastic 18, which obviously bumps hit points and gives a plus one to all Constitution saves, not just concentration checks. Proficiency provides an additional plus 5 to constitution saves, bringing that total to plus 9, with advantage to maintain concentration. It's going to take a lot of damage to break Cad's con. Good concentration. <laughs> okay, now it's time to talk about... First, it's important to remember that both druids and clerics are prepared spellcasters, so all of these spells can and should switch based on situation. Second, spell selection will change based on available preparation slots. Here we'll look at the final spell preparations. For Cleric cantrips, Guidance is an obvious pick. Arguably the best cantrip in the game, and used 87 times by Taliesin in Campaign 2. Matt also allowed Caduceus the free cantrip Decompose, which he cast 71 times. Light is an important cantrip to grab if your character doesn't have dark vision or a means to see in the dark. I can see! I can see! Sacred Flame is a decent ranged option that Taliesin also used 71 times. Instead of Thaumaturgy and Resistance, I'll recommend taking Toll of the Dead, with its potential for the highest cantrip damage die, and Word of Radiance, which along with potent spellcasting can do solid damage to multiple targets when surrounded by enemies. Surrounded. Grave Clerics also get the free Spare the Dying cantrip. At level 1, Bane and False Life are free preparations. Bless, Command, and Healing Word are all solid preparations for this level. At level 2, Gentle Repose and Ray of Enfeeblement are free preparations, but these slots should really be used for aid to bounce back multiple allies who have fallen, we know how often that has happened, or aid could have been incredibly powerful to bring up all of those fallen combatants, and Spiritual Weapon provides a nice bonus action attack, making good use of the entirety of the Cleric's action economy. Taliesin didn't cast either aid or Spiritual Weapon during the course of the campaign, instead focusing on things like Prayer of Healing and Blindness Deafness. The fact that neither Jester or Caduceus cast aid a single time in Campaign 2 is telling that the spell's power and effectiveness is not appreciated by the cast, and we're seeing the exact same thing in Campaign 3. Zero casts are the most powerful second level cleric spell. 
I'm guessing they don't realize that the spell can be used to bring unconscious allies back up or how powerful upcasting it can be. Sam, if you're listening, you're not, I know. Either way, prepare the spell. I think we all know why. You and me. Finally, Warding Bond is a strong addition that gets undervalued by a lot of the community. Concentration free, plus one to AC and saving throws, so a ring of protection. Oh, and it splits damage between you and the targeted ally. So you know how it's incredibly important to focus fire to solve 5e's action economy advantages, i.e. kill creatures fast so they can't take actions? Well, this prevents enemies from doing that to you by splitting damage over multiple creatures. With level 3 spells, Revivify and Vampiric Touch are auto preps. Revivify is a great free spell. Bringing dead allies back to life right away is good. Vampiric, not so much. Aura Vitality provides a consistent source of temporary hit points with the Cleric's bonus action. Dispel Magic is another situationally strong 3rd level spell. I'm taking Speak with the Dead too because Taliesin cast it 14 times and it proved useful in many dungeon crawls during that campaign. And finally, of course, Spare Guardians cast this all the time, and upcast it in tough battles. For 4th level spells, Blight and Death Ward are auto preps. I would make solid use of Death Ward. You can even rest cast it. Cast it right before you finish a long rest. The spell lasts for 8 hours, and when you finish the long rest, you get all your slots back. It may seem like a loophole or an exploit, but it's not. Banishment is a save or suck spell, but the effect is powerful enough that it may be worth the cast. Tal used this twice while Jester and Caleb used it a combined 13 times. Freedom of Movement is a situationally useful spell, but when you need it, you'll be thankful you prepped it. Having an ally paralyzed or restrained can absolutely wreck a combat encounter. This solves for that. And finally, Guardian of Faith is a decent spell that Tal casts 12 times. In the right situation, this spell can indeed do work. For level 5, Anti-Life Shell and Raise Dead are decent auto preps. Commune is a ritual that Cad used often, 24 times, and works thematically for any cleric. Greater Restoration is another defensive support ability that is completely situational, but better to not need it and have it than to need it and not have it. With level 6 spells, Heal and Hero's Feast are both strong spells. Hero's Feast was more of a jester spell, but I actually like this a lot better for the warm and welcoming Caduceus. He will sit down and have dead people tea with adventurers he just met that day. Preparing a massive meal to prep for the upcoming day's battle fits a little better for Caduceus than the loving yet mischievous jester. With 7th level spells, Conjure Celestial and Divine Word are both powerful. If you need some support, go with Celestial. If you're battling a Celestial and Elemental of Fae or Fiend, then Divine Word can just outright win the encounter for you. And finally, with those 8th level spells, Anti-Magic Field or Earthquake are decent preparations for an unknown adventuring day. Again, it's important to note that these aren't static picks. The type of adventure you're about to embark on will dictate the spells you pick. Talison knows this well and can pick appropriate spells to suit his and the party's needs. And there you have Caduceus Clay, Cad, Deuces, or Mr. Clay if you're nasty. A well-built character right from the beginning. The changes were fairly minimal, but do well to really strengthen the character both from a power perspective, but also a narrative view. I hope you'll join me here for the final installments of Campaign 2's Optimizing Critical Role series where we'll tackle Bloodhunters and Mollymock Tea Leaf. See you folks.